Today, I want to talk to you about what I believe is probably one of the most, if not the most important issue facing believers in Christ today around the world. And that's the plan of salvation. Listen, if you were the devil and you couldn't get rid of the Bible and you couldn't stop that, what would you do? Well, you would change the plan of salvation. You would either add to it or take away from it in order to cause men to think they were saved when they were not. I mean, you can't kill the Bible. He tried that over and over again. You can't get rid of it. It's impossible, absolutely impossible now to get rid of Scripture. So what would you do? Change the plan. Change the plan. That's what we want to talk about today on Divine Deliberations. Thanks for being here. Before we get into the lesson today, let me encourage you to hit the subscribe button and turn on notifications. That way you're notified every time we put up a new video and it doesn't cost anything. So if you don't mind, hit subscribe, hit the notification button, turn on the little bell. And, and if you will, leave us a comment. We'd love to hear from you and topics that you'd like to have addressed or whatever. Just say hello. Anyway, we appreciate it. Okay, so the plan of salvation. I really can't think of a more important subject when it comes down to what men must do to be saved and what they must do to stay saved. I can't think of anything much more important than that. I mean, we're talking about the eternal destinies of men, women, boys, and girls. So, as I said in the introduction, if, if you were the devil and you can't get rid of Scripture, you can't obliterate the reality that Christ came into this world and went to a cross to die for the sins of mankind, you can't get rid of that, what do you do? Well, you change the plan of salvation. And then you say, well, I'm not so sure that's happened. Well, actually, it started happening in the first century. But Jesus also pointed to it in Matthew, the seventh chapter, verses 21 through 23. He actually said there, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name done many wonderful works? And I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity." Now, I don't know if you realize it, but that passage is pointing to an event that hasn't taken place yet. It's going to take place, and there's going to be a lot of surprised people standing in judgment that had never done what they needed to do to be saved. I mean, if you read the passage carefully, you look at those people. They're not just coming to church on Easter and Christmas Eve. They're engaged. They're involved. They're casting out demons in the name of Christ, or at least they think they are. They're prophesying in the name of Christ, or at least they think they are. And they're doing many wonderful works in the name of Christ. These people are plugged in. They're active. They're doing stuff. But Jesus actually says to them, depart from me, ye that work lawlessness. I never knew you. And when he says, I never knew you, that comes from a Greek word that means never, ever, at any time. These are not backsliders. These are not people who have been saved, but then drifted away. They had never become Christians. And when Jesus says, depart from me, ye who work lawlessness, the Greek words anonomia against law, they didn't go into the book. They didn't find out what they needed to do. Probably some preacher somewhere told them to pray a sinner's prayer, and you're good, you're saved. But that sinner's prayer is not in Scripture. There's not a single example anywhere within the pages of the New Testament where anyone prayed a prayer to find forgiveness, and to be saved. Not one single place within the pages of Acts. On, on the contrary, Paul actually prayed when he was confronted with 
his mistake by Christ himself on the road to Damascus. He was told to go into the city and it should be told him what he must do. For three days, he neither ate nor did he drink. All he did was pray. And you can't tell me that in three days, that man who realized he had been persecuting the actual Messiah before he thought he was a false Messiah and he was throwing Christians into jail for advocating this false Messiah. He was mistaken. He was sincere, but he was mistaken. But he was told to go into the city. It would be told him what he must do. And you can't tell me for three days of praying, fasting, no doubt repenting. You can't tell me he didn't ask for forgiveness. But it wasn't what he needed to do. There was more. He was told by a man sent from God to arise and be baptized and wash away his sins. Though he believed, though he repented and called Christ Lord on the road to Damascus, he was told to arise and be baptized and wash away his sins. We need to understand something. To advocate a false plan of salvation is to condemn ourselves. I mean, it really is. And you say, well, how do you, how do you say that? Galatians, the first chapter, verses six through nine, Paul is addressing a problem in the churches of Galatia. And what's happening here is Jewish Christians who aren't comfortable with Gentiles just coming into the church decided they need some kind of law to direct them. And I would feel a whole lot better if they were circumcised. So these Judaizers, Christians who were Jews, actually were enforcing a law on the Gentiles saying, except you keep the law of Moses and be circumcised, you cannot be saved. Now, you can cross-reference that to Acts, the 15th chapter. They were actually saying, unless you keep the law of Moses and be circumcised, you cannot be saved. They were making those two things a part of the plan of salvation. What they're doing is adding two things to the plan of salvation that Paul taught. In Galatians 1, verses 6 through 9, Paul says, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ and to another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. Now, I want you to think about that. Paul is actually saying, if anyone adds anything to the plan of salvation, they'll be accursed. It doesn't matter if it's a man or an angel from heaven. What's true of adding to the word of God is also true of taking away from the word of God. I actually had lunch once with a mega church preacher whose church, and it was their creed to teach salvation by faith only, sinner's prayer, that kind of thing. We had a three-hour lunch. And at the end of the three-hour lunch, I said, it boils down to one thing. Either you are going to be condemned or I am going to be condemned. Now, that preacher looked at me and he said, why in the world would you say something like that? And I said, because if Paul preached belief, repentance, confession, and baptism for the remission of sins to have sins washed away, then you have taken away three things from the plan of salvation. You have omitted repentance, confession, and baptism, though you may try to get repentance in before faith because faith can't do anything. So you've actually taken away from the plan of salvation three things, or if it is in fact faith only and people do in fact pray a sinner's prayer and are saved, then I've added repentance, confession, and baptism. But one of us is going to be lost. I know it bugged him. I know it bugged him. And later on the next week, I noticed the website had changed to point to the necessity of baptism as far as washing away of sins and having sins remitted. But I'll get to that in just a moment. My point is this. Those people in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, they thought everything was okay. They even go so far as to make their argument at the day of judgment. It doesn't hold up. Because all of us have this book, and we need to understand something. It's not about one verse. It never has been about one verse. If it was about one verse, then John 3.16 would be all that the Bible contained. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 
Well, if you read that one verse, then that verse just says you need to believe. And if you believe, you have everlasting life. But is that all of God's will regarding being acceptable and pleasing to him? What if you don't love God? You believe in God, but you don't love God. Can you go to heaven without loving God? What if you don't repent? I actually believe that repentance is in John 3 and verse 16, by virtue of the words, shall not perish. You see, in Luke, the 13th chapter, in verses 3 and verse 5, Jesus didn't say it once. He said it twice, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. He used the identical word in Luke 13, 3 and 5, as he did in John 3 and verse 16. So he made not only faith in John 3 and verse 16 necessary for salvation, but he also made repentance necessary for salvation in Luke 13, 3 and 5. If not, why not? You see, the Bible has more to say about the plan of salvation than John 3 and verse 16. I mean, you can do snatch and patch religion. You can take one verse and build a whole church around one verse of Scripture. But the problem is, is you're going to run into other Scriptures that are going to tear that theology to the ground. We need to understand the totality of God's Word, the sum of God's Word is truth. It's not about taking one verse here or one verse there. It's about taking all of those verses. And since we are under the New Testament, since we are under that law, since that's the law that binds covenant people today, both Jew and Gentile, slave and free, black and white, it doesn't matter. God's no respecter of persons. We are all under the New Testament. That is the law by which you and I are to be governed today. And that book says, belief Repentance, confession, and baptism for the remission of sins, to have your sins remitted, to have your sins washed away. And that equals salvation. But let me get into some passages that point to that and point people away from just faith only. In the beginning of John's gospel, in John the first chapter, John said he, speaking of Jesus, came unto his own, speaking of the Jews, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, he gave the right or the power to become the sons of God, even to those who believe in his name. If you believe in Christ, you have the right, you have the power to become a child of God. But what's the implication of that verse? That belief alone doesn't make you a child of God. It gives you the power to become the child of God. It gives you the right to become the child of God. But it, by itself, faith only does not make you a child of God. The day of Pentecost, 3,000 people heard and believed the message that the apostle Peter preached, that first gospel sermon in the name of a risen Redeemer. And in verse 36, he said, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly, God has made that same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. The Bible says in verse 37 of Acts, the second chapter, when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. And they cried out and said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Well, they believed the message. They believed the message that Peter had preached, that God had made Jesus, both Lord and Christ, they realized they had crucified their long-awaited Messiah. And they cried out, what do we do? Peter didn't tell them to believe. He also did not tell them to pray a prayer, some sinner's prayer that came about within the last 100 to 150 years. He didn't tell them that either. He told them to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of of the Holy Spirit. You know, when I was having lunch with that mega church preacher and I said to him that either you or I are going to be condemned because you're either taking away three things or I'm adding three things. You know what he said at the end of that lunch? It's a little hard to get around Acts 2 and verse 38. And I looked at him and said, why do you want to get around it? You have over a thousand people over there. Preach it. Teach it. What's the big deal? Why embrace some denominational creed or some denominational doctrine that will condemn you? Why do that? It doesn't make sense. Let me point to some passages that make it absolutely clear 
that belief, repentance, confession, and baptism is part of the plan of salvation. And at baptism, sins are washed away. In Mark, the 16th chapter, verse 15 and verse 16, Jesus said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believes not shall be condemned. Now that passage says, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. The word and is a coordinating conjunction. It joins two words or phrases of equal rank. And Jesus tied them together in Mark 16 and verse 16. Now, the immediate objection most people will use is they'll turn around and say, well, it doesn't say he who believes not and is not baptized shall be condemned. It doesn't need to. If I were to say to you, he who eats his food and digests it shall live, but he who eats not shall die. You'd understand that I don't need to say he who eats not and does not digest his food because if he doesn't eat, there's no food to digest. And if a man doesn't believe Baptism isn't going to take place. Now, I'm a big fella. I could probably go out there on the street, find some little fella, and wrestle him into a baptistry and dunk him under the water. But if he don't believe, that baptism isn't a baptism at all. It's simply me overwhelming someone smaller than me and getting him wet and getting him mad. That's all that would be. My point is, Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. In Luke 13, 3 and 5, Jesus said, Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. That's the message of the New Testament. The very first words out of John the Baptist's mouth was, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The same thing with Jesus, the identical same thing. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Over in Acts the 17th chapter, Paul would actually tell the Athenians on Mars Hill in times past, God overlooked a lot of this ignorance, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. It's not all men should repent, could repent, might repent. It's they must repent. God commands all men everywhere to repent. Repentance is part of the plan. The Bible actually talks about God granting them repentance unto life. And that's important to understand. It's not about faith only. It never has been. And if you're going to talk about faith only, and you're going to say that repentance is still in there, then what you've got to do is, like some denominations, actually put repentance in front of faith. And that doesn't make good nonsense. If they don't believe, why in the world would they repent? There's nothing going to make them repent if they don't believe. But the Bible also says that you and I need to confess Christ before men. In Matthew, the 10th chapter, Jesus said, Whosoever shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father, which is in heaven. In Romans, the 10th chapter, in verse 10, the Bible says, For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. If you cross-reference this with Acts the 8th chapter, you'll see where the Ethiopian eunuch made that good confession. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It's the same confession that Peter made in Matthew the 16th chapter. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Paul would actually say to Timothy, you made the good confession before many witnesses. The confession is the faith that one has in Christ. But then the Bible points to baptism, Acts 2 and verse 38, Mark 16 and verse 16. And if you really think about it, baptism becomes important because, one, we need to get this. God is God. He can set forth whatever rules he wants to set forth to give us mercy, grace, and forgiveness. And and we need to understand something. Forgiveness takes place in the mind of God. It doesn't take place in our mind. It takes place in the mind of God. God decides when, where, and how, and at what point you and I are forgiven, where our sins are remitted, where our sins are washed away, when they're placed in the deepest of the sea and separated as far from us as the east is from the west. God decides when that happens, not us. And God chose water as a line of demarcation in times past. He chose water to bring Noah from a world full of sin to a world that had been purged of sin. He chose water to bring the nation of Israel from slavery to freedom, from bondage to a land flowing of milk and honey. 1 Corinthians 10 says when they passed through the Red Sea, they were all baptized unto Moses. 
He chose water to bring Naaman from the leprosy that he had for so long to the flesh of a little baby. He said, go and dip seven times in the river Jordan. And he went and he dipped. And the seventh time when he came up, his flesh was that of a little baby. He chose water to bring a man from darkness to light. In John the ninth chapter, he put mud on the man who had been born blind, put mud on his eyes and told him to go and wash. He said, I went, I washed, and now I see. God chose water as a line of demarcation. Listen, there's nothing magical in the waters of baptism. And it doesn't matter if you're in a baptistry or in the ocean or in a creek or in a river. It doesn't matter. There's nothing magical about the water. It is a point at which you and I become obedient to God. After our faith, repentance, confession, we are born of the water and of the Spirit. We are baptized into Christ. And that brings up a good point. How do you get into Christ? Did you know there's not a single passage within any of the New Testament that says you believe into Christ? But I can show you two passages in Romans the 6th chapter and in Galatians the 3rd chapter that say you are baptized into Christ. The first one's in Romans 6 in verses 1 through 5. Now that passage says this, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not? that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection." Now that passage says that you and I, when we're baptized, and he's talking about water baptism, we're buried with Christ in baptism. That's water baptism. We're put down, and that's another point to baptism. It is immersion. It is not sprinkling or pouring. The Greek word baptizo means to dip, to plunge, to immerse. But Paul says we're buried with Christ in baptism, and then we're raised to walk in a brand new life. Now if you look at verse 5, it says, For if we have been planted in the likeness of his death. Then we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. That's a big if. That's a conditional statement. If we have been buried with Christ in baptism, if we have been baptized, then our resurrection will be like Christ, a glorious resurrection. But that passage makes it clear. We're baptized into Christ. That's where all spiritual blessings are, according to Ephesians 1 and verse 3. That's where all heavenly blessings are. To be saved is to be in Christ. Go through the New Testament and circle everywhere that it says in Christ or in Jesus or in him. You'll be amazed how many times it says it. Romans 6 verse 3 says we're baptized into Christ. But Galatians 3 verse 26 and 27 also says it. In verse 26 he says, For you are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. How? Why? Well, the next word is for. It comes from the Greek word gar. It means to introduce the reason. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Think about what Paul's saying. He says, as many of you, how many? As many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. But we also need to understand another thing. The Bible actually goes so far as to saying baptism saves us. In 1 Peter the third chapter Peter is actually talking about Noah and his family and how they were saved by water. When they entered into the ark and they passed through the water, he said they were saved by water. He says, for as Noah and his family were saved by water, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. Now that's an important passage because it actually says baptism doth also now save us. I was at a debate once with a faith-only preacher, sinner's prayer preacher, and he was losing the debate desperately because there are so many passages point to the necessity of repentance, confession, and baptism beyond just faith and faith only. As they got to the end of the debate, the one that was debating faith, repentance, confession, and baptism as the plan of salvation walked over to a chalkboard. This was a long time ago. They didn't have... PowerPoint, but he walked over to a chalkboard and he wrote, Baptism doth also now save us, and put a checkbox, 
And baptism doth also not save us and put a check box. He came back to the podium. He looked at the faith only preacher and said, would you please go over and check which one you believe? And do you know that preacher would not go over and check either? Because if he went over and he checked the top box and agreed with Peter, he would actually give up his premise that baptism has no part in salvation. If he checked the bottom box, baptism doth also not save us, he flies in the face of Scripture because that's exactly what the Scriptures say in 1 Peter 3 and verse 21. You see, the Bible actually makes it pretty clear. If you go through the book of Acts, you'll see where almost every single conversion in there involved belief, repentance, confession, and baptism. Even if you go to the Philippian jailer, and they said to him, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Well, if they'd have walked away from him right then, he wouldn't have known who Jesus Christ was or anything about him. They'd have left him in his sin. But they didn't. Read the next verse. They preached unto him the word of God, he and all his house. And that same hour of the night, after he washed their stripes, he and all of his family were baptized. If baptism isn't important, why go at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning to a potentially snake-infested river or creek and be baptized. Why not put it off till daylight or put it off till the next day? If it's not important, why bother in the middle of the night? The point is, it is important. God has used the waters of baptism as a line of demarcation to where sins are washed away. Sins are remitted. Individuals are born of both the water and the spirit. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Now, that's the Bible plan of salvation. Now, you can embrace faith only if you want to. What are you going to do about loving God? What are you going to do about confessing Christ before men? How are you going to work all that in? you got to put it under the topic of faith. And if you do, then it's still required. Now, some people might say that, well, you're talking about salvation by works. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. Not at all. Some people think that when we require repentance, confession, and baptism as part of the plan of salvation and say that's what men need to do in order to be saved, that we're advocating some kind of work salvation. We're not doing that in any way. In no way are we doing that. The Bible actually says that faith itself is a work. Now, I understand where people are going. They're going to go to Ephesians, the second chapter, Verse 8 and verse 9 that says you're saved by grace through faith and that not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. Well, I agree with that passage 100%. But read the next verse. Verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. We need to understand something. Faith is a work. Jesus had just fed 5,000 people. And those individuals were following him, probably looking for a free meal. And Jesus turned and chided them. And said, you follow me, not because you saw the sign, but because you did eat the bread and had your bellies filled. And then he said to them, labor not for the meat that perishes, but labor for that meat which shall endure unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give you. And then they asked the question, what must we do to do the works of God? And Jesus said, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he hath sent. So I, I, Jesus made faith, belief, a work, but he called it a work of God. Why? Because God commanded it. God ordained it. God instituted it. Guess what? When it comes to repentance, God commanded it. God ordained it. God instituted it. When it comes to confession, God ordained it. God commanded it. God instituted it. And when it comes to baptism, God commanded it. He ordained it. He instituted it. It's not a work of man. It's not the works of law. It is simply doing what God said to do. Now, some people may say, well, that sounds like legalism. It's not legalism at all. Jesus said, if a man love me, he'll keep my commands. And he commanded everyone that follows him to be baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. That's the Bible plan of salvation. That's the truth. And I hope you'll embrace it. Thanks for joining us. If you have any questions or you want to contend regarding this or dispute something I've said, put it in the comments. Be kind and be courteous and be Christian. But I'm more than happy to answer any questions 
objections you might have regarding this Bible plan of salvation that I've made clear to you. And, and there's so many more passages that point to this. But hey, if you want to talk about it, you got questions, let's talk about it. I'll be happy to defend everything I've said with book, chapter, and verse, because it's in there. Don't be fooled. If the devil can't get rid of the scriptures, he can't stop people from learning about Christ, then all he has to do is change the plan. In Matthew 7, 21 through 23, those people thought they were saved, but they weren't. Someone told them, you're fine, you're saved, you prayed the prayer. And Jesus says to them, I never knew you, ever, at any time. You had never become Christians, according to the book. You were lawless. Depart from me. I hope that doesn't happen. I know it will because Jesus said it's going to happen. So I know there's not everybody's going to listen to this Bible plan of salvation. Many are going to continue to embrace faith only. and But it's necessary that we teach and preach the truth. Remember, Jesus said, you shall know the truth. And the truth will make you free. God bless you. Be safe this coming week. We'll see you again next week. Oh, by the way, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Turn on notifications. If you like the video, like it and share it. We sure would appreciate it. Be good the next week. See you next Thursday. God bless you.